Welcome back to John's Films, your home for DaVinci Resolve benchmarks, tips, and tricks. Today we're setting up a computer for DaVinci Resolve from scratch. Let's get to it. Here we are in our BIOS, and the first thing that we need to do is make sure that we're taking full advantage of the RAM in our motherboard. We put 3600 megahertz RAM, so we're going to check AXMP, turn that on. That turns on the settings that allow the RAM to run at its full capability, not at 2400 megahertz, but at 3600 megahertz, significantly impacting the speed at which we're running this machine. The next thing we need to do is make sure our boot order is in business. We want to make sure that we're booting to our USB hard drive before we boot to any of our native hard drives. Why? Well, because the operating system sits, there we go, on that USB hard drive. That's what we're going to install from. We will then install to the UEFI hard drive you see right behind it. Now we are set to go. We're going to hit the X up in the top right hand corner, choose save and reboot to our new BIOS. Now, because we put the USB drive as the first drive in the boot order, it's going to boot into my Windows boot disk. This is a drive I have prepared by going to windows.com and downloading their download tool. I've created the drive, and now here we are ready to install Windows. Choose your language, default operating system, and boom, hit install. At this point, you do not have an active key, and click I don't have a key. We will activate this later, either through a key we buy online or through a key we buy from the Microsoft Store, which would be digital activation. The major benefit there is it saves your drive for you. You're going to choose custom, install Windows only. And now I've run into a problem. I've got three drives, two SATA, one NVMe. I don't want to install the operating system on either of the SATA drives. I'd like to use the NVMe. So I'm going to go back, shut down the system, and unplug the SSDs. Poof! Now with some movie magic, I only have one hard drive installed and my USB drive, which is drive 1. So I'm going to install Windows on drive 0, the unallocated space. Windows will now install the appropriate files by copying them to the hard drive. They'll get the files ready for installation and then register the system against the components that we installed in our previous video. If you didn't see that video, we did a full build video and this is actually part 3. Before that, we picked all the parts for a video editing workstation. Now, it definitely doesn't take as long as it used to, but I sure wish it'd go this fast these days. There we go. It will reboot. It'll bop back up. You'll see the same boot logo that we saw before. Make sure you uninstall your hard drive at this point, the USB hard drive. And in fact, if you plug in the extra two SSDs, that's a good idea too. With the USB hard drive uninstalled, it'll default to your standard boot drive, the one with the master boot record on it. That's your NVMe drive. And you'll see this sign, getting ready. If you've got a different motherboard, you'll see a different logo there. Don't worry about that. Windows is overriding the bottom half of the screen and giving you the good sign. Now we will immediately boot into Windows and you'll have the opportunity to create your first user through the welcome screen. To get there, we choose our region and then we pair an applicable keyboard layout to it. We have the option to add another keyboard layout. And finally, we're going to get into a network. Here I've got it hardwired, but I'm going to connect over the Wi-Fi just to make sure that it works. If this is your home network, click Yes. Allow it access for public networks. And now we'll click Next to move on to our next screen. This one is going to be a setup and it's registering the network against everything that you do in Windows. It's got your keyboard set up and you're going to create your user data. Now with the option to create an online account, I'm going to choose limited experience. I'm building this for the film director. He's going to come in later and set up his own Microsoft account. In that case, I'm just going to call it the film machine. And the film machine is going to need a default password. It might again warn me that I need to use an online account. Well, at this point, I'm not. If you do, it will tie it to your Microsoft account and it will preserve your settings as well as your license to your account. Now you choose the values and questions that you want asked of you when you forget your password. Here I'm going to choose some dummy answers because this is not a computer for me. In this case, everything's film machine. And again, it'll be changed when the director gets the PC. And we are moving on. Now it's going to ask you all a whole bunch of privacy questions. What would you like exposed to Microsoft? In this case, pretty much nothing. Uh, no online speech, thanks. Find my device is useful, and I'd suggest you leave that on so that if somebody were to steal your workstation, especially if it were a laptop, that'd be a smart thing to do. Advertising ID off, location, don't need it right now, but hey, it can help in some cases. 
And diagnostic data, no thanks, tailored experiences. That means can we advertise to you in a specific way that we know who you are and what you're doing? No thanks. And now activity history shared. Nope, only device that's using film machine. No Cortana, be quiet, please. And finally, we are ready to get into the machine. With the Cortana font, fortunately, she's been deactivated, right? Time warp again. When you get to the almost there sign here, you know that you're going to boot directly into the operating system next, and you're at your default windows. Now we have a few tasks that we need to take care of before we can fully take advantage of this machine. The first one is to make sure we have DaVinci Resolve installed. First, I'm going to go download it from my web browser, Internet Explorer's below. I will be downloading Chrome in the future. And I can go to Blackmagic Design slash support. Once in the support page, I click on DaVinci Resolve Fusion, and that's what allows me to find it quickly to download. There we go, Blackmagic DaVinci Resolve Fusion, the second bubble over, scroll down, and choose the first studio update that's below. I happen to know I want to run a benchmark on this, and the benchmark's broke in the latest beta that's out. So I'm going to go with 16.2.5 Studio, and download only link in the bottom left. I'll be using my studio key for this, and the director will put his in once he gets the box. So now we download. While I'm downloading, I also am going to start looking into NVIDIA drivers for my graphics card. Uh, further, I can get AMD drivers for the chipset, and I'm going to want to make sure my operating system is up to the latest. Here we go to NVIDIA.com. Those of you that built along with me and are using the same parts will want to select GeForce drivers. The GeForce drivers are for our RTX and GTX graphics cards. These are different than your Quadro drivers like you'll see in the professional ones. Select Download Now under Automatic Driver Updates that will install the GeForce Experience for you, which not only will update you about the latest drivers that are out, but will also give you the opportunity to switch between the gaming and studio drivers on your workstation. On laptops, I've noticed, it seems that you cannot have the studio drivers unless you bought a studio-grade RTX Studio laptop, and the cheapest one of those I find is about three grand, even though I got the same hardware in a $1,500 one that you can see in the link above. Resolve Studio is still downloading. Unfortunately, their download uh, client, whether they use Akamai or some other edge-based network, um, is a lot slower than most of them. I'm on gigabit here at the house, and that would have come down in about three seconds if it were a fast connection from Blackmagic. As you can see here, we've already got a four or 500 megabyte NVIDIA launcher that is already down. So we will install that by double clicking on the GeForce Experience link and then later signing in from our GeForce Experience account. Mine you will see is linked to my Google account, just making things easy. So here we are, agree and install. And it will install not only the updates, but uh, give you a chance to download the latest drivers. There we go. And now install those drivers with the full experience. After signing in, now you've got the option to optimize your games, get game ready drivers, etc. But what I'm going to do is skip the tour, hit drivers, and hit the three dots hamburger menu in the top right, switch to studio because the director is not much of a gamer. <laughs> He's all business. So we now want to make sure we switch to the NVIDIA Studio drivers for the RTX 2060 Super that's in his machine. The now that we're done with the driver install, it was a good time for a reboot, and I'm back to my login screen. Here we are, click or drag, control, delete, whatever you like, password, fill machine. And off we go. Here I've logged in, and I'm going to start a few things going. One, I'm going to make sure my other disks are here, and sure enough, I've got my C drive, my D drive, and I'm now going to hit my... Uh, format disks and drives to make sure I get all of them involved. Seeing that I have only one of the drives showing up in Windows Explorer, I'm going to check Device Manager and see if they're here under the disk drives heading. Sure enough, two SSDs, one NVMe drive. So I will use the Windows key again and make sure that I've got the right drives mapped and formatted for use in Windows. To do that, I hit the Windows key and type in Format, which then gives me Create and Format Hard Disk Partitions. Now it says you must initialize before the disk manager can access it. That would be disk 1. That's the one we do not see in here. I click it for a GUID partition table because I don't want it to be a boot drive, which would be a master boot record. And now I'm going to be able to access that drive and use it as a disk. I have to do that by coming down to disk 1, right-clicking, 
go into new simple volume, create a simple volume on this formatted with NTFS, as that's what I'm going to use with for Windows. Sign it a drive label, let it do a quick format, and boom, it will now show up in my operating system as drive E. So now I've got my primary drive, I have my project drive, and I'll have my scratch drive. I'll take this opportunity to label them for the director so that he's got them where he wants them. With my drives relabeled, it's time for me to install DaVinci Resolve by double clicking on the install file. I'm going to choose PostgreSQL as this is a studio version of Resolve and it's potential he may want to back that drive up, allowing us to have a small yet accurate backup of all the files and media that he's got. I do not need DaVinci Resolve keyboards. I'm going to let him install his own panels if he needs it later. At this point, it's just going to be a default Blackmagic Raw Player plus DaVinci Resolve sitting on top of Postgres SQL. You'll notice several things come in here. Don't worry. Postgres is a back-end database. There's some C++ libraries that need to be put in so that Resolve can use them. But overall, this is a very efficient program and they continue to clean the code up between every release. Because we installed the database, we now get to restart. Having popped back up again, I'm now going to check for updates by hitting the Windows key and typing Windows Update. That allows me to download all of the latest drivers, Windows components, that are necessary for this computer. In addition to Windows updates, I'm going to go directly to the motherboard manufacturer and download the latest software available for the chipset and the audio drivers. You can see I've double-clicked the installers and I'm working through the chipset drivers as we speak. John, I just want to see the benchmarks. Well, unfortunately, if you've built along with me, this is everything you need to do to make sure that you're up to date and you have the cleanest stuff possible and best hardware foundation to run your computer on. This should be our final restart. And now when we come back up, we're going to get to the fun stuff. As you can see during the shutdown, we will have an update here from Windows with all the components that I've updated from Windows updates. Let this complete. Do not turn off your computer. It will mess things up. The countdown, and now I count up on the back side as we come out of the back end of a reboot. We're able to now log into Windows as we'd expect. Film machine, film machine, yet again. And we're into Windows. The first thing I do is launch DaVinci Resolve. And with DaVinci Resolve open, it gives me a welcome tour. I can take the tour to learn more about the software, or I can skip straight to it. I'm going to skip straight to it for the purposes of this install, but feel free to go through it, set your key bindings, and your preferred setup. It will ask you if you've installed the Studio Edition for your activation key at this point. Like I said, I'm going to put mine in and let the director use it until he types his in. The way this key works, I'm typing it in behind Blur so you don't take it, because it's good for two activations. And the activation server keeps track of which were the last two computers to use it. And then if you were to log into another one, it deactivates all your other licenses and now starts a new activation cycle. So by giving the director the use of it temporarily, he'll use it for a second while he gets installed into the machine. And then when I log in again to my workstations, of which I have the two, it will deactivate all of my licenses outstanding, including taking his away, and now I'll put it back on my two workstations. Once I've gotten into DaVinci Resolve, you can see I immediately hit Shift-9 so that I could pull up the project settings. I'm setting my default settings now for a 4K timeline in which we monitor at 4K. It's because the director may have an external monitor he's going to use as a secondary color grading panel. I'm choosing 24 frames a second as he typically shoots and edits feature films. And I'm going to choose to update the cache clip at the very bottom. And this is important. I'm putting this to his scratch drive. We explicitly bought a drive for this function. We might as well use it. Now I've selected the cache drive and that's where the cache will go. Keeping the very frequent reads and writes of the cache to the scratch drive allow us to keep the NVMe drive for our operating system and program operating at full speed at all times. Further, I know he's going to be shooting in B-RAW, so I'm going to change my RAW profile over to DaVinci Resolve Blackmagic B-RAW. And now we are basically set up. I will check and save his settings under his master settings presets. Here I'm able to save it as a current default, and he can load that as his default settings. That really gives us the opportunity to make sure we're always working in 4K, always working 24 frames, have the cache set properly, and this is the profile system you should use for it. Finally, I'll go to DaVinci Resolve and Preferences menu, 
Here, this allows me to set the overall system preferences as well as user preferences for working with DaVinci Resolve. I want to ensure that as graphics card shows up here as the primary video card, I will enable display GPU for compute, uncheck auto and choose CUDA to ensure that for the NVIDIA graphics cards with the CUDA cores, I'm using CUDA, and manually choose that graphics. If you have multiple GPUs, Studio will enable that here and automatically recognize them. Now I reach across the 10 gigabit network connection I have to my server and pull my benchmarks. Prepping for my benchmarks, I have opened Task Manager by right-clicking on the Windows logo in the bottom left and choosing Task Manager. Then click the Performance tab and this gives us the ability to see the performance of each item in our computer. It will launch as the benchmark runs. This is the Puget Systems benchmark. It'll launch DaVinci Resolve in quiet mode so you don't really see it. And we'll walk through five different projects, which gives us five different benchmarks. Now I've scrolled down the task manager and you see my NVIDIA GeForce RTX 2060 Super is cranking along 64 degrees, which is fantastic for 98% utilization. The CPU is cranking along at 4.15 gigahertz steady on all cores. I am really pleased with the hardware. Let's find out what those benchmarks show. As you well know, I don't have Excel installed, so the CSV file opens in WordPad. Score is 876 to give you some scope and scale. That is fantastic. <laughs> it's right up there where a RTX 2070 Super ran around 915, I think it was, on a uh, Ryzen 3600. So the balance between the systems, the 3900 with Studio here, is going to do really well with Blackmagic RAW, which is not in this benchmark. Because of that, I want to show you what it looks like. So John, the scores are nice, the numbers, I, I, I don't know, probably good. But show me what it actually edits like. Well, here we go. To that end, I've now loaded up a B-RAW clip. This is native B-RAW shot on my Blackmagic Pocket 704K. It is quality zero and is uh, one heavy file. Here I'm going to start dropping LUTs on it to see exactly how well it plays back. Note this was 24 frames a second footage and playing it back is butter. Because I didn't trust that, I did later go and check 60 frames a second footage, as heavy as I could make it. And I tell you what, this stuff plays back cleanly, the LUTs apply very smoothly, there's no problems. If I edit and qualify out certain items and elements, still no problem. Noise reduction does bring this thing down a little bit and cause it some pain, but even as much pain as I could bring it, it would still play back at maybe half, half the frame rate. Use of proxies or optimized media would immediately make this incredibly editable. In this case though, uh, what I would really do is just put your noise reduction in your first color grading node, and then I would cache that node and no longer have any issues with it as I edit smoothly. This is one fantastic kick butt workstation. If you've built along with me, let me know below. I'm really excited to hear if anybody else has built this machine and what your experience with it is. And if you'd like to say thank you and this has been a big help, feel free to buy me a coffee at the link below. Otherwise, I really appreciate you watching. Let me know. I'd love to hear if you made it through this series and it's something that helped you. Thanks for watching and have a great day.